What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here to examine an issue of the X-Men today. I'm here to examine X-Men issue 51. Uh, this has two stories. The first story is written by Arnold Drake with pencils by Do We Have to Tell You? Uh, that's Jim Steranko. I don't know why they're getting cutesy with the credits here. Uh, with inking by John Tardiglione and lettering by S. Rosen. And then we have a backup story here that continues the origin of how the Beast joined the X-Men. Uh, this is written by Arnold Drake with penciling by Werner Roth, inking by John Tartag. Uh, that is John Tartaglione. I don't know why they abbreviated his name here. I get the feeling someone said, hey, I'm tired of writing your whole name out. We're just going to give you a nickname here, even though Tartaglione had been involved with this series for like 20-something issues by this point, and his name is written out in full in the credits for the main story of this issue. So that was a little weird, uh, with lettering in that backup story by Herb Cooper. And uh, this issue is a little bit of a letdown for me. Uh, there are several things about it that just don't work. Uh, now we find out that Mesmero and his big organization that's been doing stuff for the last couple of issues, uh, we saw at the end of the previous issue that Magneto is here. Uh, we see that he is here giving orders to Mesmero. Uh, it wasn't really made clear at the end of the previous issue if he was affiliated with Mesmero or if he was just coming in after the X-Men defeated Mesmero to kind of uh, steal their thunder. But he is here giving orders to Mesmero so apparently he has been uh, pulling the strings by Mesmero this whole time, and uh, this would have felt like a bigger deal if we hadn't just seen Magneto, like, five issues ago, uh, before the X-Men went their separate ways and we had two issues of X-Men solo adventures, uh, Magneto was fighting the X-Men and then we had a little bit of a crossover with the Avengers. If we didn't have that crossover story, this would have felt like a really big deal. But we just saw Magneto, so this kind of feels ho-hum to me. Uh, also, this whole issue feels like a battle for the soul of Lorna Dane, where Magneto is trying to tell her, hey, I'm your dad, you should join my side, and then the X-Men, or specifically Iceman, uh, he is saying, no, your dad is a crazy supervillain, you shouldn't enjoy him, and, uh, I don't really care because we haven't gotten a chance to get to know Lorna yet. Uh, she's still very much a non-character. Uh, she was kidnapped by Mesmero, and that's about it. We don't know a whole lot about her, so uh, her making any kind of decision is kind of going to be what informs her character, and at least for now, she seems to have made the decision to join Magneto. And the book is playing it like, oh, she doesn't have any choice. This is her father. She has to join him. And I don't know, if this comic had been written and came out a good 10 years later even, I think we would have had a scenario where Magneto would say, join me, I'm your father, and it would be kind of like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, where uh, Norman Osborn says, you're like a son to me, and Peter says, uh, I have a father, his name was Ben Parker. Uh, I feel like if this came out in the later years, you would have more of a positive angle on, you might be my biological father, but uh, someone else raised me, and they raised me to know better than to throw in with a maniac terrorist like Magneto. Uh, so this is playing it like, oh, she has this tragic choice she has to make. Does she join this crazy supervillain, or does she join the X-Men? And seemingly for now, she joins the uh, joins uh, Magneto. And so, I don't really like the way this is playing out. I wish that we could get in Lorna's head a little bit more. Uh, this is only the third issue that we have gotten to see her, and really, this is only the first time that we've really gotten a chance to get to know her at all, uh, because in the previous two issues, she didn't get to do a whole lot, especially in her first appearance. Uh, she was almost run over by a car, Iceman saves her, and then she comes out of the shower and she has green hair, and that's about all we know about her in that issue, and then uh, in the last issue that we talked about, uh, she does use her powers to kind of keep Mesmero and his people away, so she does seem like she's ready to go with the X-Men at that point before Magneto shows up, uh, so I feel like this would have more weight to it if we had gotten a chance to know Polaris a little bit more, if uh, she had been part of the X-Men for two or three adventures, and then we find out that Magneto is her dad, then this would have felt like it mattered. It would have felt like, okay, whatever choice she makes is going to be a big choice. Uh, but also, uh, I feel like Polaris kind of feels a little bit shallow because she's making the choice to join Magneto, and yes, he is her biological father, or at least uh, that's what the comic is telling us now. Uh, there's always been a little bit of is she, isn't she on uh, her relationship with Magneto, but uh, it says, yeah, she is his daughter, but 
he's kind of a crazy supervillain, and he's tried to take over the world multiple times, and Iceman even tries to bring that up, and she doesn't really seem to care about that. Well, he's my dad, I gotta stay with him. And she hasn't flat out spoken about her decision, but since she stays behind while the X-Men all escape, uh, it seems like her decision has been made, and I don't like that. I think that the character of Polaris needed to be fleshed out a little bit more before they try to throw this uh, heart-wrenching decision her way, uh, and as such, her seeming to make the decision kind of does inform the character a little bit and not in a good way. Uh, also, you have Iceman who is acting like he is head over heels in love with Polaris and that's weird because just the issue before this Mesmero storyline started, he was out on a date with Zelda and now suddenly uh, Zelda who? Uh, we don't even know who that is anymore. And I knew there was going to come a point in the Silver Age X-Men books where Zelda and Vera would stop showing up and honestly, good riddance, uh, those characters were never developed. They were just there to cause problems for Bobby and Iceman, uh, I'm sorry, Bobby and Beast, whenever they wanted to not be X-Men, and every time they would go on a date, they would have to throw that away and go be X-Men again, and it wasn't interesting, it was boring, uh, it kept being the same thing over and over again, uh, just throw them in a date, and then something happens, they have to use their powers without the ladies finding out, it's the same old, same old, every single time, it was never interesting, uh, I'm not gonna cry about not seeing those characters, but it would have been nice if we could have seen Bobby and Beast uh, have to break up with the ladies, hey, we're moving to California, California. It's been great. Not really going on a serious date with you ladies. Bye. Mwah. You know, au revoir. Whatever. Uh, that was my attempt at French. Uh, but then, as soon as Bobby meets Lorna, like, as soon as he meets her, he brings her back to his apartment and tells Beast, oh, I couldn't help it. Uh, it was a lady in distress. And I don't feel like this relationship has had a whole lot of time to develop, and uh, they are going to act like these two are seriously madly in love and have known each other for years, and this relationship has had a lot of time to grow and develop, and it has not. Uh, it's going to get worse where Bobby thinks that Polaris is like his soulmate, and he just met her like two issues ago. Uh, so I feel like... It would have worked better if all of the X-Men were trying to explain to Polaris, hey, your dad is a supervillain, if it wasn't just Iceman, if they were all saying, we have met him multiple times, uh, he has fought us and tried to kill us multiple times, and that also makes it a little weird that Polaris decides to stay with Magneto, because he's over here screaming about how uh, he must kill the X-Men and he can't rest until the X-Men have been destroyed, and she's over here like, well, I'm your daughter, I guess there's nothing I can do about it, uh, but uh, all the X-Men, uh, they escape, and then Cyclops is acting like because Bobby is in love with Polaris he cannot be part of this uh, so Bobby runs out uh, he and Scott almost get into fisticuffs with each other and uh, I've been talking about how this series needed a little bit of internal drama with the team and how for a long time uh, that source of internal drama was the love triangle between uh, Jean Grey, Scott Summers and Angel and then they got rid of that in the early 30s uh, in the issue numbers but now uh, they need something else to kind of create drama and so now uh, that source seems to be between Cyclops and Ice Man. Uh, Iceman is in love with Polaris. That love came completely out of nowhere. He doesn't know her at all. He's spent about 10 minutes with her, and in fact, she doesn't even know that he is the guy who saved her when she was almost run over by a car. She still does not know uh, Bobby's secret identity, which at this point, I guess it's a good thing they didn't reveal their secret identities to her since uh, she's now chosen to join Magneto, but it's still weird to me that these guys were almost teammates, basically. Polaris was this close to being an X-Man, and they're still keeping their identity he's a secret from her, so that's a little bizarre. Uh, but uh, Scott is not portrayed as like, I am very wise, everyone must listen to my decisions, uh, because he hasn't been the full-on leader of the X-Men for very long. Uh, Professor X only died a couple of issues ago, and uh, now the team is back together after briefly being scattered across the country, and so it makes sense that one of the X-Men would say, uh, I don't have to listen to you, uh, it wasn't too long ago that you were only second command. I just wish that that drama came from something a little stronger than, hey, Bobby, you just met this girl three minutes ago, and you're head over heels in love with her, and now your love is going to endanger the X-Men when we're out in the field. I wish that it was a little better than that. Uh, so Scott says that he has a plan, and then on the last page of this issue, we see someone show up at uh, Mesmero's Mutant City, which I guess is Magneto's Mutant City now, and uh, this is Eric the Red, and uh, he is actually on the cover. Uh, if you look at the cover here, you might think that this guy is going to be a huge part of this issue. He's not. Uh, he's in the last page of this story, uh, but he comes in and he's got like fire coming out of his fingertips and the ground is quaking beneath him and he says, go tell your master that I'm here, I am Eric the Red and I am awesome and 
I'm not looking forward to this because I know who this is. This is an actual character we've seen before in a costume, and none of this makes any sense with the revelation of who this is later on. I'm not going to say who it is, uh, but uh, already I feel like they're building up for this to be a character, and then they change gears uh, halfway through this uh, revelation or this introduction of this character. So uh, anyway, uh, I'm gonna hold my breath and hope that this series gets a little better. But uh, this issue, I did not enjoy it as much, and I guess I should talk about the backup story with the Beast. Uh, basically, we find out that the supervillain who was watching the football game where Hank McCoy revealed his mutant abilities, his name is the Conquistador and he has a sidekick named Chico. Uh, these characters are awful. It's about like uh, Meccano and uh, the Warlock and uh, Tyrannus and Mole Man, these characters who would show up and just be completely awful. Uh, I get the feeling that Arnold Drake is enjoying these backup stories about as much as I am, which is to say, not very much. Uh, I feel like he would probably just rather this whole series be set in the present day. Let's do 20 full pages of this story with Mesmero and Magneto and Polaris, but we've already committed to doing these backup stories back when Roy Thomas was on the book, so now we have to keep doing it at least until we introduce all of the X-Men in these backup stories. So, he's doing it, but it feels to me like he's doing it more out of obligation, but not so much because he wants to do it. Uh, but anyway, uh, the townspeople don't hate Beast. That's the thing that surprises me the most. They're all really excited about Beast winning these football games for them, and they're not ready to kill him like uh, the town that Iceman is from. Uh, when Iceman uh, revealed his mutant abilities, uh, everyone was ready to lynch him. And then here, Beast wins some football games, and it's like Teen Wolf. No one cares that he's a mutant. And that's interesting, uh, because this series has been very inconsistent on do people hate mutants or not. And in theory, uh, it shouldn't matter, because uh, people seem to like the Avengers, and some of the Avengers are mutants, like Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, but then people love Captain America and Iron Man. So, uh, there shouldn't be any reason that someone would see Beast uh, doing weird stuff like grabbing onto the football post with his feet and then saying, he's a mutant, let's kill him. Uh, they shouldn't instantly go to that, uh, but maybe eventually if the Conquistador is like attacking the town to get to the Beast, uh, which he doesn't do that yet, uh, I don't know if he's going to do that, but maybe eventually they might say, wait a minute, it's all because of that Beast, he's the reason that the Conquistador is attacking. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the Conquistador, he kidnaps Beast's parents. Uh, meanwhile, Iceman goes to his house uh, to see if he could recruit uh, the Beast Beast. Apparently, Professor X has not learned his lesson from when he sent Cyclops to recruit Iceman. Apparently, once again, he wants to send a 15-year-old to go and recruit this guy into the X-Men. And uh, Iceman goes and sees that the house has been ransacked and there's signs of a struggle. And so then uh, the X-Men are like, well, uh, who could this be? You know, why is uh, someone else has, must have found out that the Beast is a mutant? Which, yeah, he was on TV. Everyone in the state saw that football game. Someone knows he's a mutant for sure. Uh, and also, Angel is part of the team. So, a few issues ago, at the end of the uh, Iceman origin uh, little storyline, uh, it hinted that we were going to get the uh, origins of the Angel, and then we skipped right over that into the origins of the Beast. Well, now, Angel is part of the team. So, it's really weird, the the, uh, the order that all this is going in. You get Cyclops, first X-Man, then you get Iceman, second X-Man, and then they hint at the third X-Man, but then they show us the origins of the fourth X-Man, and then I'm assuming they're going to go back and show us the origins of the Angel before the Beast uh, joined. Uh, that was really weird. Uh, I don't know if that was a mistake by Werner Roth and they said, oh, let's just leave it in, or if that was deliberate, but that was really odd. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's about it here. Uh, we are still expanding on the, like, page of uh, the Beast's origin story uh, that we saw way back in that uh, first uh, Sentinel storyline. Uh, we are expanding on that from when that first happened, uh, which was, like, around issue 13 or so. Uh, so we're getting, like, multiple issues kind of exploring that and uh, adding to it a little bit, uh, because there was no hint of uh, the Conquistador uh, in any of those uh, any of that flashback stuff way back then. Uh, so this is uh, kind of retconning stuff a little bit more uh, from uh, what we saw then, uh, but that's okay. Uh, and this is fine. Uh, the Conquistador just hit puberty a little bit. This is fine. The Conquistador is not a villain that I'm especially interested in. I don't think he shows up again after this origin stuff. Uh, honestly, I didn't think that we needed another super villain uh, to show up in these origin stuff. Uh, I think we could have done something kind of similar to uh, the town tries to lynch Iceman, and then the professor uh, expects Bobby to, or expects Beast to join him, like, hey, uh, you don't have a home here, but you can have a home with me. I would have been fine with something like that, uh, but maybe they don't want it to be too much like the Iceman origin stuff, uh, in which case, that I can understand. Uh, so, uh, that's about it for this issue. Consider this one examined.